Thank you for joining me. I'm Jocelyn, and today we'll be examining the Frick Collection's Long Case Regulator Clock, which is currently on display in room 19 on the fourth floor at Frick Madison. This clock was made in 1767 by a number of different artists. The bronze sculpture and relief elements were made by Philippe Caffieri, the clock's case by Balthazar Luto, and the movement within the actual clock mechanism was made by Ferdinand Bertou. All three were prestigious artisans, with Bertou being the clockmaker to the king. Luto, the cabinet maker, and Bertou, the clockmaker, had worked together for 25 years before the creation of this clock. While this is among the first works Gaffieri made with them, his work had already taken the spotlight in the world of neoclassical art. The years during which this clock was made were defined by a heavy interest in classical motifs. This can be seen in the bronze relief elements on the clock. Notably, the sculpture group at the top depicting Apollo driving the chariot of the sun. However, before we delve into the clock's iconography, I'd like to examine the clock as precisely what it is first, a timekeeping device. A long case regulator clock is a clock housed in a tall cabinet, which can be depended upon to keep time accurately and consistently. The Frick's clock stands at an impressive eight feet, three and five eighths inches. During the 18th century, a clock that didn't lose time, even as it was being wound, was a relatively new invention, so this clock was cutting-edge technology. The method to keep the clock consistent was achieved through the use of mercury and varied metals in the pendulum, as we can see here, and was pioneered in England. This allowed long-case regulator clocks to replace short, shorter clocks, which had been popular but not quite as accurate. Do you know how dependable they were? Long-case regulator clocks were housed in both the homes of the wealthy as at Frick Mansion and in public spaces to help keep a standard of time. Our particular clock has no identified owner, but belonged to members of the French aristocracy for a time, which illustrates the type of people who would have owned such a clock. The clock boasts four functions. It measures solar time, solar mean time, the weather, and the date. Solar time and solar mean time are measured by the hands upon the clock. Solar mean time is a system we still follow today. And, perhaps unfamiliar to a 21st century audience, solar time was actually a common feature of clocks of this period. It is based on the position of the sun and is reminiscent of a sundial, changing depending on the season. These two golden hands show the solar mean time, while this black hand ending in a circle indicates solar time relative to solar mean time. On the clock face is also the date, visible at the bottom of the face in a window over the Roman numeral 6. The keyhole here, also on the Roman numeral 6, allows for the winding of the date and month. Around the clock's face, we can see the 12 zodiacs. Constellations change their place in the sky depending on the time of year, and this passage of time is what the clock depicts. Below, there is another face. This is a barometer which tells the weather. The barometer dial moves according to air pressure and indicates everything from fixed good weather to tempest. We will now turn our attention to the bronze reliefs on the clock, beginning at the top. Atop the clock face is a pedestal which has an inscription from Ovid's story of Phaeton below a figure in a chariot. The inscription is in Latin and translates as follows. Meanwhile, the flying horses of the sun, Pyreus, Aeus, Aethon, and the fourth Phlegon, neighing, filled the air with fire and beat the door with their feet. This passage describes the horses of Apollo being impatient to begin their daily journey across the sky. While the man who holds the reins has been identified as the sun god Apollo, I am interested too in the possible reading of the figure as Phaeton, the son of Apollo and whose myth the inscription comes from. The story of Phaeton is a tragedy. He is filled with the pride of youth and tries to drive the sun's chariot. Unfortunately, Phaeton is not strong enough and loses control of the horses, which makes Zeus strike him down before he can burn the world to ash. If we are meant to understand the figure as Phaeton then, and indeed a learned viewer would likely make the connection to the text, the whole clock becomes a monument to the tragedy which comes with the hubris of trying to control the passage of time. That said, the identification of the figure as Apollo is strengthened by a comparison to a statue at Versailles by Jean-Baptiste Toubi, which also depicts the god's daily journey. When reading the figure as such, the clock then becomes a reminder of the passage of time, but also a way of glorifying Apollo. This allows us to see the clock almost as a temple to the sun god, celebrating the passage of time and the changes it brings with the statue above acting as a cult statue. It also serves as a celebration of the kings of France, especially the sun king Louis XIV. Louis XIV is famous for styling himself after the sun god Apollo. However, this clock was not made during his rule, 
but rather during the rule of his grandson, Louis XV. Even then, the House of Bourbon had continued to connect itself not just to the Sun King, but to the Sun God in order to augment their own prestige. Louis XV styled himself as the heir of his grandfather's ambitions and took great pride in his family's history. While we do not know who exactly commissioned and owned this clock, we can safely assume they were connected in some way to the French court. In this context, the subtle invocation of Phaeton, the luckless son of a god, could be read as a critique of the previous king. This is another reason why the presence of Apollo is stronger and the identification more likely. Regardless, there is still a nod to the son of the king. If we look closely at the Minahand here, we can see that it ends in a dolphin. In France, the term for the heir to the throne is dauphin, meaning dolphin. It is interesting, then, that one of the aspects of the clock, which moves with the passage of time, represents the future ruler of France. In this same detail, we also see the fleur de lis, representative of the French monarchy. The overall decadence and drama of the clock is emblematic of the style of living in the French court. The most dramatic moment on the clock is the movement of the horses. They are brimming with impatience just as Ovid describes them and toss their heads and pull at the reins. Their legs and the cloud they rest on protrude over the side of the clock with shadows and make them seem even larger. We can see in this image that the driver is tilted as if bracing himself against the horse's pull with an arm outstretched for stability. Interestingly, the reins used to be in both hands of the figure, suggesting both the strength necessary to guide the animals and the intensity of the driver's movements. The overall effect of the bronze is a very powerful forward motion. Beneath this moment is the inscription mentioned earlier, as well as the face of the clock, again alluding to Apollo's dominion over the passage of time. With the inclusion of solar time and the constellations, both night and day are placed under the god's charge. Continuing down the clock, on the right side, we have the nymph Daphne, who allowed herself to be turned into a tree to escape the affections of Apollo. On the left side is a nymph Clytie, who turned into a sunflower for want of Apollo's affections. Both are symbolic of change which time brings, as well as the tragedy of mixing mortality with divinity. At the bottom of the clock are low reliefs which depict the seasons, again aspects of the change time brings. Here we can see winter on the right, with spring and summer on the front. Below the reliefs is a marble slab which was added when the clock was brought to the Frick Mansion in order to better match the floor. The combination of these two elements brings again to mind a Greek temple. The reliefs are like a frieze and the marble like a stylobate which elevates the temple. Furthermore, the clock here seems to almost grow out of the wall as a result of its architectural design. The clock brings to mind the grandeur and power of the sun god Apollo and the sun king Louis XIV through both its function and design. We are then reminded of the grandeur of a time long gone and the enormity of time left to come. Thank you for coming on this close look with me.